Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this session, we will examine some critical moments from the legendary Bobby Fischer's games. Let's get started with our first example in this lesson. Here we are. We look at this position, it's a white turn. We'll see that the white rook is being attacked. And here, white moved the rook to the most natural square, although it wasn't the very best one, moved it to c1. It was important, though, to keep the rook on the first rank, as if it would move up, for example, to the second rank, attacking the pawn, that would allow the black rook to come down to d1. So, rook c1 was in the game, and it seems that it's not a bad choice, because it attacks the pawn on c2, and if black responds with the most natural move, coming down with a rook to protect it on c2 and at the same time threaten to capture on g2 with the other rook, then the white pawn would run away. And at best, what black would hope for, even though the white pawn is about to get promoted to a queen, is to give perpetual checks. And simply before the white queen would arrive to checkmate and promote, the black rook would give unending checks on the second rank. And neither side would get out of it unless they would try to lose the game. So just king f1 and check. Coming here, of course, would be a blunder because black would checkmate now. But after the king goes to g1 and then h1, the checks would simply never end and neither side could do anything better than to settle for a draw. Going back to the beginning of this position and looking at the position after rook c1, while we see that we do have a draw at hand, we should try to look and see if there is a better way to play for a win. The main thing that is going for black in this position is the back rank weakness of white, as well, of course, as the far advanced passed pawn on c2. Of course, if we lose that pawn, things won't be good because white would still maintain the passed pawn both on the a and the c file. Try to see and look if there is any immediate elegant way to take advantage of the temporary tactical flows of the white position. This game was played by Bobby Fischer at the Capablanca Memorial in 1965 against the German master Lehmann. And here, Bobby played rook a5, a very powerful move, not only winning a pawn, but the game as well. It is clear that if the white rook now captures the black rook, that would allow checkmate in 2 started by rook d1. And then if rook takes, pawn captures back, promoting the pawn to a queen. On the other hand, if white does not capture, but, for example, starts moving the king closer to avoid a back rank checkmate, even though it's not going to be a checkmate, but black will promote his pawn successfully by first trading a pair of rooks in the corner and then forcing the trade of a second pair of rooks with rook d1, check, and after the exchange of rooks, white cannot avoid the black pawn from promoting. Let's move on to our next example, which is another game of Fishers. In this game, Bobby was white and he played the Dutch international master Hans Ray. And this game was played in Israel in Natanya in 1968. At the moment, it seems that Black's position is okay. There is a material balance and there isn't an obvious way for white to gain any kind of advantage. 
However, in reality, Vite is ready for action and ready for material gain, even if only for a little bit. Now you may think that, okay, there is a pin along the D file and maybe that's what we need to use, which is a great first thought. However, after a search, I bet you didn't find anything that would actually uh, lead to a material gain connected to that pin. Actually, there is a different pin that we're talking about here, which we still need to create. Again, I suggest you take a little bit of time and try to find the correct answer on your own. And here, Byte has a brilliant sacrifice. In fact, sacrificing the most valuable piece, sacrificing the queen on e6. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Just for a bishop. When the queen captured back, now White created a pin with bishop d5. Of course, if black does not capture, the queen will be lost no matter what. And even if black gets a bishop as return, as a deal, white won a pawn already. Assuming that queen will be lost for the bishop, white gave up a queen for a bishop and pawn and is gaining black's queen and giving up only his own queen and bishop. But no matter what, white is winning a pawn. Black tried not to lose even a pawn. And after bishop d5, took, took, and took on c3. And this is one of those situations, one of the main differences between grandmasters and, let's say, beginner players or even average club players that the more experienced players would count just a bit farther than compared to that the less experienced player would stop the calculation and therefore evaluate the resulting position incorrectly. So from the distance of the very beginning of this uh, example, if you calculated that, okay, if all these moves happen, the first three pairs of moves, it's still material balance. However, an experienced eye would calculate just a bit further, and typically the rule of thumb is that you'd want to calculate a variation as long as there are forceful moves. And in this case, the next forceful move is rook c1. It is forceful because it attacks the black bishop. And then, when it moves, it's quite clear that behind it, the pawn on c7 will be lost. The only way black could avoid losing that pawn if that bishop could move to a square from where it would protect it. But here there is no such safe square. In addition, the bishop is also busy in protecting the knight on a5. So that's, it. that's why the bishop moved to b4 right now where it still protects the knight, and white was ready to capture the pawn on c7. What's important here is not just the one pawn that white already won, but a couple other things. One of them is that the knight on a5 is very much out of the game, and in fact doesn't have an easy, simple, or quick way in getting back to the game. If you look carefully, you'll see that all the squares where the knight may go to are covered and controlled by white pieces. The second problem is that white is about to double up on the seventh rank his rooks. And as typical, that's an extremely powerful and dangerous attacking pattern when you have both your rooks on the seventh rank. Black right now played rook to a to c8, trying to trade rooks, which certainly would ease in black's situation. But white denied that offer by simply moving the rook to a7 and attacking another pawn on a6. And black responded with rook c2, counterattacking in hopes of changing pawns on the a file. But white, of course, focuses on what they need to in getting the second rook also to the seventh rank. 
Now White threatens with a famous three move checkmate, which would continue with rook a2, then rook g7, and another check, and the third check actually ends the game. So that's certainly something for black to avoid, and that is why black responded with bishop c3 protecting the pawn on g7. And now yet another very important preventive move. White played rook a to c7. On one hand it pins the bishop, and not less importantly it takes away the possible squares from black's knight along the c-file. If right now black would capture the pawn on a2 in hopes of back rank checkmate, that would be a miscalculation, as after rook takes bishop and check, white could safely block the check as the bishop also controls that key square on the first rank. Going back to the position after rook a to c7, black now responded with h6 attacking the bishop and white simply and calmly retreated the bishop making sure that that bishop still controls the key c1 square which of course if it wouldn't control and would allow the black rook to get there that could result in a back rank checkmate so it was very very important to keep an eye on your opponent's potential threats and not just your own attacking plans let's move on to our next example which is yet another game of Bobby Fischer's however this one is on the losing side his opponent was the legendary Russian Grandmaster Yafim Geller. And this game, just as the first one we saw in this lesson, was played also at the Capablanca Memorial Tournament in Cuba in 1965. And this is a very critical moment of the game where the normal expectation would be for the white queen to capture the black bishop on f3 and of course that would result in giving up the pawn on b6 and would result in a queen endgame with equal number of pawns. However, this is an excellent example of a simplification example. Like here in this position, white has an opportunity to get rid of all complications and generally pawn endgames are the least complicated of all endgames because they are the most predictable. Let's say if one side has a passed pawn, that pawn will either get promoted or it won't. So it's a very clear set goals and then it's relatively easy to outcalculate them. I'm not saying always, but in most situations, yes. So in this case, instead of playing a long queen endgame with unknown result, white has a forceful way to trade queens. Black has no choice but to exchange and the pawn captured back. And now it doesn't matter which way the black king goes, white will come out first by now just capturing the bishop. The black king needs to run back and now a key move, a very important move that wins the game. If white immediately would play king h3 going after black's pawn on h4, the game would be a draw after black gets to protect the pawn. As after, let's say, king g4, king c6, black's pawn on g5 would be taboo, as then the h-pawn would run away. However, the point is that in this position, after black just played king d6, the move is a very fine move, which results in a simple win. is f4. It prevents black from connecting his pawns on the g and h files, and therefore, white now will simply go with the king and eat those pawns. After king c6, king h3, king takes, king takes, and the black king comes back just one move too late. After king g6, now the white king is simply helping the marching of the f-pawn, and white's win is in no doubt. 
a very nice simplification exercise similarly as what Fisher did against Rie in the previous example let's move on to the next example here we go and this is another game that Fisher was on the suffering side in one of our previous lessons we saw how Fisher won a very nice game with a nice combination against the Hungarian-American Grandmaster Paul Banker. This was revenge time, in fact this game was earlier in 1958. At this point Bobby Fischer was rather young, just 15 years old, but already one of the top players in the world. So in uh, this position it's White's turn and White is already a pawn up so things are looking pretty good for White no matter what but unless White finds the immediate tactical opportunity here the game could still go on for quite a bit. However here White has a very cute and powerful move namely well let me not tell you I'll give you a chance to figure it out on your own and then here is the solution. Rook d7 pinning the black queen it cannot run away on the other hand if it captures the rook on d7 then knight f6 forks. Black can try something which Bobby did that was rook e1 check and then after king f2 knight e4 check inviting white to capture the rook and now queen captures d7 well it's true black accomplished one thing namely that the pawn on f6 now is protected by black's knight however it does not save the day because white now plays simply queen g6 check and then just grabs the bishop on h6 with a second check resulting in an easily winning endgame and let's move on to the next example. Here we go. In this game, Fisher's opponent with black was Weinstein. And this has been played in the 1960 US Championship. It looks like a rather sharp position, with neither king being in a completely safe position. However, white's king is still much safer than black's because not only that the b-file is open, but white has already doubled up his rooks along that file. In fact, the key square in this position is the b8 square. White has not only the two rooks aiming at that point, but also their bishop from g3. However, at the moment, black has sufficient protection of that square by his rook and knight and king. So the task is clear. If we could deflect either the knight or the rook, then white would be ready to give checkmate in two. And that's exactly what white needs to do. The correct move is queen h6 and that's exactly what Bobby Fischer played and his opponent resigned. Black's position is hopeless because if rook captures the queen, then indeed, as we said, rook b8, knight b8, followed by the elegant checkmate with the rook. On the other hand, if in this position, for example, the black queen retreats to f8, trying to protect the rook, then the bishop on e6 is hanging, and then the knight on c6 is also attacked. So again, black's loss is rather clear. And finally, if in this position, when by the way the rook and the bishop are both attacked, if the rook moves to e8, then white will follow up the combination by a second deflection, by capturing the bishop on e6, and again if rook captures queen the same checkmate, or otherwise white is threatening to capture the knight as well as either rooks. A very nice end. Let's move on. Here we are. 
And this is another game of Bobby Fischer's against Green, played in New York in 1963. Right now, white is a pawn ahead, which is certainly nice, but the game still could go on for quite a bit if white would miss this excellent opportunity at hand. And here again, white is using the method of removing the guard, removing a defending piece from its current position. And that elegant move is moving the rook to b7. The point is that if black now captures the rook on b7, white is ready to create a skewer, check, and then grab the queen, which would result in clear material gain. In the game after rook b7, Black continued with rook e7, because white's threat was, in any case, to give a check and then capture the queen, because once the black king would be on the seventh rank, the black rook would be in a pin. So that's the explanation for black's move of rook e7. And now white simply advances the pawn, and black is pretty much helpless from that pawn just advancing further and further. Black is almost in a Zugzwang. And finally, let's see the jewel of the week. Here we go. Well, let's look at this position. What's going on? We have even number of minor pieces and it is black who has two extra pawns. In fact, at the moment, white's last pawn is in jeopardy as well on c6. Well, that's almost like a hint. The white pawn needs to get out of harm's way. So the first move is pretty easy and simple and natural. Just advance the pawn. Now this pawn is protected by the knight and is ready to get promoted. In addition, it attacks black's knight. So it seems like a simple deal. However, Always remember, look out not only for your own plans, threats and great ideas, but also of your opponent. It's really important to constantly do that. The knight moves to c6. Now, if the white pawn advances and promotes to a queen, black's plan was to give a fork and get rid of that newly born queen. And once that happens, for example, after king b4, knight takes queen, bishop takes, and bishop takes knight, it is black who is ahead. So this certainly will not lead to white winning the game. So, after c7, knight c6. Is it all lost? Not at all. Quite amazingly, white is ready to win this game but not by promoting the pawn to a queen, but a so-called under-promotion. Under-promotion is a situation when you have an option to promote the pawn to a queen, but you choose voluntarily to promote it to a lesser value piece. And in this case, that would be to promote to a knight. How beautiful! What an absolutely amazing checkmate! I hope you enjoyed this Jewel of the Week and learned from the games of Bobby Fischer. As you can see, he is amazing, but even sometimes he ends up being on the suffering side. Well, always look out for the tactical opportunities, as more often than not, they are the decisive factor in the game. Thank you for listening, and so long until next week. Bye -bye. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving 
your chest without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.